Bless you all. I'm uh, kind of exhausted today, so that could end up being humorous for you. We'll see what comes out of my mouth. But uh, when I'm sleep deprived, that's how it, that's how it results. But anyway, so uh, it's really a blessing to be here. I'm, I'm honored. Uh, like Daniel said, he's a, he's a wonderful friend of mine. I'm the executive director of a ministry called Good News for Israel. We're the oldest Jewish outreach organization in North America. I've spoke here before, so some of you know me. Um, and, uh, and today, actually, uh, there's an interesting topic, and we'll get into that, but uh, actually, before we say anything, let's pray. Lord, I do thank you for this time, Father, for these people here, God. Lord, we just ask that you draw us closer to you, Father, and in drawing us closer to you, that we do become closer to one another, Father. Father, move in our hearts, Father, move in our hearts to spur us to do your will in our lives, whatever that might be, God. We just want to be your humble servants, Father. We want to please you, God. And Lord, we thank you, Father. We thank you that you listen to us, God, that you, uh, that you have an ear that can hear us now, Father. And Father, we thank you for the sacrifice that you made through your Son, Father, so that now we can be reconciled and in your presence. God, move in our hearts today. We love you. We praise you. In Yeshua's mighty name. I mean, so I'm basically an evangelist, honestly. It's really what I am. They've put me into an administrative position, which I don't know. It's only by the grace of God that that'll work. But, uh, but that's really what I am. I, I share the gospel with people, and, uh, and I'm kind of a timid person, actually, so uh, it's not easy for me to go up into the streets and just to talk to somebody. So often what I do is I actually put myself into a very, let's say, confrontational situation. I go and I minister in mosques. I minister at, in, uh, at Mormon wards. I minister uh, at places to where it's more confrontational. And I'm not confrontational in my delivery. I'm not confrontational in the things that I say. I just will preach truth. But it allows these conversations to build up. But in so doing this, I, I uh, realized some things and, and some of these truths that came out and it starts to show me, well, I, what is going on here? Why are they believing these false doctrines? Why are they not in line with Yeshua? Why, what, has, what has happened in these people's lives? Because in order to be an effective witness, I have to care. I really have to care about the people that the Lord has put in my path. Because apart from a broken heart, people are not going to be moved. We have to be broken. Our heart has to be melded with the Lord. It has to. And the Jewish people are some of the hardest people in the world to reach. I guarantee that. I actually would much rather witness to Muslims. Much rather. It's much easier for me. It's crazy, it's crazy, but it's true. And, uh, and so in doing that, and so it's trying to understand these things and studying these things and being like, well, Lord, how do I reach them with your good news? How do they reach them with the gospel truth, with what you've given me, what you've done in my life? And I'll talk about that briefly in a minute. But, uh, but anyway, so what, what he's instructed me to do is, is then to really just to care about these people first and foremost, to be brokenhearted in prayer for them, and to hopefully understand them in such a way, and to understand where the disconnect is so that we can do what we're called to do, which is be ministers, and to per perform this ministry of reconciliation, as Paul says in First Corinthians, or Second Corinthians chapter 5, of reconciling people to their God by explaining to them what Jesus Christ has done for them on the cross. So we're going to be talking about his revelation. In Hebrew, the word for revelation is chazan. Actually, it's chazon, excuse me. And it means a vision, a message from God. It's possibly visual. In Greek, it's the word apoko, oh, forgive my Greek, <laughs> especially when I'm exhausted. <laughs> Apocalypsis, an apocalypse. It means disclosure, unveiling, manifestation, appearance, something spiritual or enlightenment. For the best of my understanding, there's three general forms of revelation people can have. The first form of revelation is direct revelation. Direct revelation is something that you as an individual would receive, okay? Direct revelation is something that is not really attestable by others, necessarily. You can see a change in character from the individual. You can see things that happen within the individual that has changed them or something different has occurred as a result. But a direct revelation is personal between an individual and the source of the revelation, 
So people that have claimed direct revelation, obviously Moshe, as as the Lord spoke to him out of the bush. Uh, You know, Isaiah here, as as we'll read, it, it spoke of direct revelation. Muhammad said that he received direct revelation from an angel, okay? I believe, actually, I do believe that Muhammad and Joseph Smith here that you also see, I do believe that they received a form of direct revelation. I just do not believe it was from the Lord. Okay? And, and I do, and I do believe that these people, unfortunately, are terribly deceived. I myself came to faith through direct revelation. I was an atheist at the time. I was born and raised Jewish. I became sick of it because there was no presence of the Holy Spirit, which we'll actually talk about a little later, too. And so I became... I became bored of it, and I became an atheist, and I was duped into a Bible study by a cult. I became overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit, of the, uh, by the Holy Spirit just from reading the words of Jesus, of Yeshua, in, in Luke chapter 15, uh, and, uh, and became a born-again believer. It just changed my life. And so it was just life-changing at that point in time. Everything in my life changed. I moved from a place of, of being suicidal, depressed, to, uh, drug addiction, uh, alcohol abuse, to where all those things were gone the next day. But... So the only, the only way for me to show anyone my direct revelation is what changed in my life, right? That's the only way that I can show that to anybody. So that's direct revelation. Isaiah says when he sees the Lord in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, in the year of Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe lifted the temple. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 12, John says, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke to me, And have turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, like the Son of Man, clothed with garment down to the feet of the girded about the chest with a golden band. These people had direct revelation. God showed them something that later affected their lives, okay? The next form of revelation is secondary revelation. Secondary revelation is if somebody receives revelation and they share that with somebody else. Going back to these forms of revelation, by the way, uh, they can be good or bad, right? It can be good or bad, but it always has to line up with the Word of God, and that's something that we'll emphasize here in a bit. So just because somebody has direct revelation, that can be a good thing. It can be wonderful. Praise God, the Lord changes lives that way, but also it can be a form of deception. We always have to check these things versus Scripture, which is also something we'll be covering. But, But anyway, secondary revelation is something that I receive and then I share it with you, or something you receive and then you share it with somebody else. It's the act of witnessing, right? Witnessing is a form of secondary revelation. Okay? If we, someone were to write down their testimony in a book, again, it's a form of secondary revelation. Just preaching the gospel, again, it's a form of secondary revelation. It's us receiving something and then sharing it with others. Unfortunately, it's not just us who does this. People who go door to door in your neighborhoods are giving a form of secondary revelation to them that isn't true. But secondary revelation in itself isn't a bad thing. As we look at Acts chapter 17, verses 2 through 3, then it says... Then Paul, as his custom was, went in to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. So again, Paul is demonstrating a form of secondary revelation. Paul saw the risen Lord. He saw Yeshua raised from the dead and he is now describing what he has learned to other people in a form of secondary revelation. Jonah, when God gave the prophet Jonah a message to give to the Ninevites, in Jonah chapter 3, verses 4 through 5, it says, And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The people of Nineveh believe. Oh, sorry, that was the title. <laughs> I shouldn't have included that. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaiming a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. See, I told you I was tired. But anyway, as we continue here, so what happens is, is Jonah receives a direct revelation from God. He shares that revelation with the people. They repent. Another form of revelation is corporate revelation. Corporate revelation is when a group of individuals all witnesses something, okay? Examples of this are the Sinai Covenant 
Okay, when Moses, when when the people of Israel saw the miracles, they saw Moses coming down from the, from Mount Sinai. They saw the things that occurred there. They saw the parting of the sea. They saw they saw what happened with the plagues. So this was a form of corporate revelation that was given to the people of Israel. The resurrection of Yeshua is a form of corporate revelation. Many people witnessed the resurrected Lord. Things like public healings can again be forms of corporate revelation, things that multiple people see, things that are supernatural that there can be no other possible explanation for. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 18, it says, Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightnings flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. All the people saw this, right? So this is a corporate revelation. Actually, there's a Jewish tradition, and it's not something that uh, is scriptural by any means, but there's a Jewish tradition that says that the Jewish people accepted the Sinai covenant because God held Mount Sinai over them and threatened them unless they accept it. <laughs> I don't necessarily believe that, but, there's, but again, there, the idea is there, right, of a corporate revelation of that they all believed. Although, you know, Jewish people, are, we can be stubborn, so I do understand. But anyway, going back into, it's Exodus chapter 24, verses 1 through 4, it says, Now he had said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. But anyway, so the, again, it's a form of corporate revelation. There's an important section of Scripture. This is uh, probably the earliest creed that we have in the, out of the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament. And this creed is actually written by Paul. And actually one of the oldest parchments that we have of, of the New Testament is this section of Scripture right here. And this is what's stated. It says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scripture, and that He was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, He was seen by five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present. So again, He's giving this, this statement of these people can attest to to Yeshua, to his rising up, to his being put to death and to his rising from the grave. And these people are alive today. You can talk to them. Corporate revelation. Something that's interesting is these forms of corporate revelation also are the things that then bring in Scripture. Authoritative Scripture needs two things, and one we'll go over later, but, the, but one of them, okay, one of the things that it always requires is some form of corporate revelation of large groups of people for witnessing this event, okay? Because apart from that, we really don't have any scripture developing apart from what many people witnessed from where there were many witnesses. The last form of revelation, which really just incorporates all of the other three, is just scripture, okay? Because scripture is all of the three, it's direct revelation. It was revelation given to men, inspired to write the Word of God. It's revelation that is secondary because it's individuals who are writing things down to be shared with others. And it is forms of, as we said, corporate revelation because these things that were seen were, were witnessed by multiple people, were tested by multitudes. And the, the books that we have written within our scriptures were written by many people over thousands of years. In 2 Timothy Chapter 3, verse 16, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And as we read earlier in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9, it says, And these words which I commanded you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk, to, talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. It's so important that we know Scripture. And any form of revelation that is received needs to be checked against Scripture. Okay? And this is, a, this is essential, right? And this is why the Jewish people, they always had all of these different means and all of these different ways of remembering Scripture. Okay? 
Because if something does not line up with Scripture, if some later revelation does not line up with the previous revelations that we have attested to, we have the beginnings of cult. So now we're going to look at this. This is cult. This is actually uh, defined by the Oxford Dictionary. It says, a system of religious variation and devotion directed towards a particular figure or object. For example, the cult of St. Olaf. It says, a relatively small group of people having religious beliefs or practices regarded by others as strange or sinister. An example is a network of Satan-worshiping cults. The third one, which really is what we're going to be focusing most on, is a misplaced or excessive admiration for a particular person or thing, a cult of personality, surroundings of leaders. So, as we look at these different organizations, that's really what happens here, okay? Is, and this, is, this will be universal, and you'll see this. With any Western religion that I can find, what develops, what happens is, is secondary revelation. Remember, what somebody shares with you begins to take precedence over any other form of revelation, and that is cult. Okay? When secondary revelation takes precedence. So secondary revelation taking precedence over anything that the Lord directly spoke to you. Secondary revelation taking precedence over Scripture itself. This is the beginnings of cult. First group we'll look at here is the Jehovah's Witnesses. They're started by an individual by the name of Charles Taze Russell in the year 1870. They started something and they, they distribute a magazine that's called the Watchtower Magazine. Watchtower Magazine is their secondary revelation as I will show you guys. Okay? They say that it takes precedence over anything. Over scripture. You couldn't possibly understand it without the Watchtower magazine. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania are the ones who are in charge. It's a group of seven individuals who run the organization. They're appointed by from within the group consistently. Okay? And what they tell you is what is printed in these magazines and that ends out being true. So again, secondary revelation. What they're telling you takes precedence over God's word or any other form of revelation. Joseph Judge Rutherford was the person that continued this group and actually really began what is called the Seventh Day Adventists, or excuse me, excuse me, Jehovah's Witnesses. Seventh Day Adventists actually were the origins for Charles Taze Russell. And you'll see some similarities where the Seventh Day Adventists themselves were big on date setting and they were big and, and they became big on following individuals as they did with Ellen G. White. One of their focuses is what they say is the Lord's true name which they say is Jehovah, which right off the bat is insane if you think about it because they're even getting that very fundamental part of their faith wrong. There is no J in Hebrew, and, and the, the name is most likely not Jehovah. It's Yahweh. But, but anyway, all these things aside, these people are being led astray, and they're being told that you, that, that you have been mistaught all of your life and that they know the truth. They say that God's kingdom is here on earth. What ended up happening is through multiple prophecies of the Lord's return, which we'll talk about towards the end there, as you see, and when one of the times it didn't happen, they said, well, <clears throat> Jesus actually established his kingdom many years ago. I think they say in 1914, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, 1914. And so they say that Jesus' kingdom is already established on earth, and that's their organization. They don't celebrate any feast days, right? So they see problems with some of the feast days. And historically, Adventists probably would have understood this too, just like the Messianic congregations do, to where a lot of feast days, as they, we've been introduced in Christian cultures, probably their roots, well, definitely their roots, are not from, uh, from historical Judaism, right? But they've taken it to an extreme, and they get rid of any days, anything. So they won't celebrate Passover, they won't celebrate any of the feasts, they won't celebrate you know, Sukkot, none of them. They won't celebrate birthdays, they, just, they want to get rid of everything. It's very controlling. They're big on Armageddon, they're huge on the end of the world. Okay? And this has been their thing, and as you see these dates here, 1847, 1878, 1914, 1918, 1919, 1975, these are all dates that they proclaim that something major was going to occur, either from the return of the Lord to the judgment of the earth, or all these different things. And, so, and obviously, I don't think that anything significant happened these days. I actually had a 
Jehovah's Witness come to my house the other day, and there was a Jewish Jehovah's Witness I had been reaching out to recently from their group, and, and she was trying to explain to me that many groups said 1914 was going to be an important days within, day within Christianity. And I didn't know the argument. I had never heard it before, but it just was, it was so ludicrous to me. I asked them to explain to me where that was, and she took me into the section in Daniel and then took me into Revelation where they're defining times. And so through these definitions of this word times, they say, well, now it has to be at the year 1914. And I said, I don't even know anything about this argument, but I, I bet, I bet if I look up the word in the Greek Septuagint of the Old Testament and in the Greek for Revelation that it's not even the same word, but because you guys are an American-based religion with, that's not nearly as educated as you believe, I bet that they're different. And I, I didn't even know, and I looked it up, and of course, they're different words. So, so they're defining times translated into English as times translated into English, even when in Greek they're completely different words and saying it's the same thing, okay? So, and, and I, I told her, I said, remember that Jewish, there's a Jewish guy that was with you guys. I was witnessing to him. I said, I want him to come back. So she's sending him back, so pray for this guy. But anyway, <laughs> coming on. So this is actually from the Watchtower. Listen to how they actually emphasize the importance of their own writings over even Scripture. It says, <clears throat> all who want to understand the Bible should appreciate that the greatly diversified wisdom of God can become known only through Jehovah's channel of communication, the faithful and discreet slave. That is the Watchtower Tract Society. That's from Watchtower Magazine, if you guys ever want to look up these references in October 1994, page 8. And I'll have references for all of these. I'm not going to read them all, but you guys can take it down and use it anytime you want. It says, the next one is, Thus the Bible is an organizational book that belongs to Christian congregation is an organization, not to individual, regardless of how sincerely they may believe that they can interpret the Bible. The Lord tells us that his word is not too difficult for us to understand. But these groups say you couldn't understand it. It says, and from time to time, there have arisen from among the ranks of Jehovah's people those who, like the original Satan, have adopted an independent, fault-finding attitude. They say that it is sufficient to read the Bible exclusively, either alone or in small groups at home, but strangely, although such Bible reading, they have reverted right back to the apostate doctrines that commentaries by Christendom's clergy were teaching hundred years ago. So, listen to this, okay? This is crazy. They're saying, if somebody studies their Bible on their own, they come to old conclusions. That's crazy. They, they say that they must be misled. Not that there's similar truths in what people get out of studying their Bibles on their own than they would have had previously. But uh, anyway, as we continue here, it says, we should eat and digest and assimilate what is set before us without shying away from parts of the food because it may not suit the fancy of our mental taste. We should meekly go along with the Lord's excuse me, theocratic organization and wait for further clarification. Again, talking about their group, about the Jehovah's Witness. That you have to wait for them to clarify things. And finally it says, we all need help to understand the Bible. We cannot find the scriptural guidance. I'm going to need some water. Somebody could grab me some. Guidance we need outside the faithful and discreet slave organization. <coughs> See, I was better that time I covered. But so again, they say you couldn't possibly understand Scripture without their guidance. Again, secondary revelation taking precedence over primary revelation. This is an organization for some reason I know a lot about. Funny, I've met actually quite a few Jewish people in going to Mormon wards to witness. Sad. The Mormons, or Latter-day Saints as they call themselves, they started in 1820 with an individual by the name of Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith proclaimed that an angel came to him and gave him something that he calls the Book of Mormon. Later, this organization was taken over by Brigham Young, who in 1946 moved it to Utah. They have some interesting teachings over the years. The, most, the one they're most well known for is polygamy. 
It's interesting because the Book of Mormon both condemns and endorses polygamy. They have a prophet, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but the prophet likes to make changes, but he seems, not to, make cha- he seems to make changes when governments come against their teachings. Interesting how God changes his mind when governments pressure. In 1890, they gave up the idea of polygamy because in order to, in order to become a state, they could no longer hold on to that doctrine. They believe that in ancient Israel, this is crazy, but they believe that in ancient Israel, ancient Jews sailed over to the Americas. There were good and there were bad Jews. The bad Jews killed off the good Jews. God cursed them and made them dark-skinned, and that is the Native Americans. That's what they teach. They won't argue against this. I'm not making this stuff up. They've reinstated temples. In their temples, they do things like baptism of the dead. They believe that if a person dies, that they can give them a second chance by then baptizing them Mormon after they have deceased. They also do something that they call eternal marriage, which is insane because Scripture is very clear that no one's married in heaven. But they'll do that so that you would be married to your, house, your, to your spouse for eternity. They, the head of their church is the Mormon prophet. and He dictates what's... Uh, well, we'll go into that a little bit later. But, and then they also teach that you can become a god. They say that the fall that occurred in the Garden of Eden was a good thing because Adam was becoming more like God. And that's ultimately your goal is to get your own planet, to be your own God. In 1978, they changed their mind about black people. This is interesting. So they, because they believed that a cursed person was dark-skinned, they did not allow a black person to be in the priesthood until 1978 after a lot of civil rights pressure conveniently, their prophet says that God changed his mind. (laughs) Not that they were always wrong. So you'll see where these things are from. Actually, I'll talk about it. I think that the first one is actually from a general conference, which is where their leaders speak. And then the next are all actually from their website, from the LDS website, mormon.org. You can look it all up. It says, But the president of the church is in fact a prophet, raised up in these last days to give inspired guidance, not only to latter-day saints, but to all mankind everywhere. So their leader of their church, they say, is a prophet, right? And he hears directly from God. And whatever he says, as we'll see, will take precedence over any other form of revelation. It says, and verily, this is directly from their website, I say to you that the conditions of this law are these. All covenants, contracts, bonds, obligations, oaths, vows, performances, connections, associations, or expectations that are not made and extended into the sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise of him who is anointed both as well for time and for all eternity and that too most holy by revelation and commandment through the medium of mine anointed, who I anointed on the earth to hold this power, and I have appointed unto my servant Joseph. So this is talking about Joseph Smith, and then this thing they say is passed down to current prophets. It says, The president of the church presides over all priesthood, uh, quorums, and general membership of the church. This was the president at the time, President James E. Faust, of the first presidency explained, he is the senior apostle on the earth. He has been ordained and set apart as the prophet, seer, and revelator to the world. He has been sustained as the president of the church. He is the presiding high priest over all the priesthood on the earth. He alone holds and exercises all the keys of the kingdom under the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church and is the, ch- and is the chief cornerstone. They're giving him the mantle of Jesus Christ on earth. Listen to this. This is crazy. If the rest of it wasn't, huh? It says, the living prophet that has power of TNT, by that I mean, this is all from their website, directly from the Mormon official website. Today's news today, God's revelation to Adam did not instruct Noah 
Uh oh, Daniel, what, does this have anything to do with your series you've been teaching? <laughs> By the way, I'm normally not this funny, I'm exhausted. God's revelation to Adam did not instruct Noah how to build the ark. Noah needed his own revelation. Therefore, the most important prophet, so far as you and I are concerned, is the one living in our day and age to whom the Lord is currently revealing his will for us. Therefore, the most important reading we can do is any of the words of the prophet contained. They're talking about their current prophet. Each month... In our church magazines, our marching orders for six months are found in the general conference addresses, which are printed in the, uh, in the Ensign magazine. And, it says, and this, this is interesting down here. Listen to this section. Beware of those who would pit a dead prophet against the living prophet, for the living prophet always takes precedence. Again, secondary revelation taking priority over any other form of revelation, cult. Don't get too angry at me, anyone here, after this one. The Roman Catholic Church. I remember I was reaching out to a young uh, Roman Catholic gentleman when I was working at the Denver Rescue Mission, and he was... uh, VM, actually, he wasn't even Roman Catholic, but he was defending the Roman Catholic Church. He was Russian Orthodox, and they have problems with the Roman Catholic Church. But for some reason, he always defended the Roman Catholic Church. But he said to me at one point, he said, you Christians always take certain verses, and that's just all that you go on. is just one here or one there. I said, you guys only stand on one verse of all of Scripture, and it's this verse. It's right here. This is, their, this is everything. This is all that they stand on for anything that they stand for, and it's right here. And he says... And he said to them, Jesus speaking in Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 through 19. But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And so they say that he is the first pope. And then this authority, then this Peter, they say, can then have passed on to the next bishop of Rome, who would then pass on to the next bishop of, bishop of Rome, and so on and so forth, until they started passing it on to the popes, and then that's where the Roman Catholic Church traces their roots from. There's some, a couple interesting things in notes here, as many of you, I'm sure, know. The word Peter and the word rock are different words, okay? Petros and Petra, possibly creating a distinction between the two, saying that you are Peter, but upon this rock I shall build my church. And later in Scripture, it reveals that what is being described here is opening, or excuse me, as as far as uh, give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. This is emphasized in like Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, and Revelation chapter 21, that this power is given to all those who are preaching the gospel, to the apostles, to the foundation. And this is referring to, to the gospel message, right? Because once somebody comes into salvation, then the keys of heaven are given to them. They are bound to the kingdom of heaven when they enter into that relationship with the Lord. And that's really what you're being referred to. This is actually from the Catholic Encyclopedia. It says, During his life, Peter was never officially the bishop of Rome or the pope, but in honor of his work and his role as the head of the church, he is recognized as the first pope. Every pope since Peter is considered the uh, immediate successor of Peter. And not of that pope's immediate, or excuse me, and none of, not of that pope's immediate success. success ugh, immediate predecessor, a pope is considered to be carrying on the power that Christ granted Peter today. A great number of pope's power are uh, derived from the Petrine guarantee, which is etched in Latin around the dome of St. Peter's Cathedral. The pope's powers were bolstered in the First Vatican Council in 1870 when 433 bishops passed the decree of papal infallibility 
according to the degree the Pope is uh, possessed of that infallibility which the divine Redeemer wished his church to be endowed is defining doctrine regarding faith and morals. Again, right? Secondary revelation taking precedence over any other form of revelation. A Catholic.com, which I assume is a Catholic website, <laughs> says, So far as the interpretations of individual scripture passages go, keep in mind that the church does not, as a rule, define how specific verses are to be taken. That's good. Instead, it defines doctrine, and that definition may eliminate some interpretations of particular verses. This is not good. But so again, we see the same type of pattern. Islam, interesting. While it doesn't necessarily continue in this regard fully, okay, they do to some extent, the origins were in taking secondary revelation and putting them over any other form of revelation. Muhammad uh, actually was around around the year 600 A.D., okay? and he preached a, uh, a, a message of monotheism to a very pagan area. Actually, they had a strong Jewish influence, apparently, in Mecca and Medina. Muhammad lived in the, in the city of Mecca. He got in trouble there. He retreated to Medina, built up an armed force, came and conquered Medina, and created this religion in the process. What he wrote, the Quran, was supposedly inspired by angels. It's actually fascinating, the parallels between Joseph Smith and Muhammad. Both of them received their message from angels, supposedly, directly. They both were supposedly both illiterate men and wrote these books, okay? They both preach a message of, that, that has a lot to do with sexual relations in heaven. They both preach a message of works-based salvation, that you have to work through this, that you have to be, your good has to outweigh your bad. You know, they both preach these type of things. There's a lot of similarities. Actually, at one point in time, both of these religions split up in similar ways where the Sunnis and the Shias split up. One was more so of the lineage, the blood lineage of Muhammad, and the other was really his military lineage. The same thing happened with Joseph Smith, where his family actually did not go on to form the Latter-day Saints, the Mormon church. They went on to form the Reformed Latter-day Saints. They're out of Missouri. And, his fa and, and it was actually his uh, followers, the, those who really wouldn't necessarily have been in charge of his military, but of his organization, Brigham Young, who then followed the LDS church. So you see all these similarities between the two. They're very similar religions in a lot of ways. Some of the funny teachings have to do with heaven, heavenly, earthly pleasures. That heaven is all about what you're going to get out of it. It's all about these pleasures, these wonderful things that you're going to get. You're going to be able to recline. You're going to have these beautiful virgins. You're going to, which I don't know how that works with women, but but anyway, so so all these different things that are supposed to occur, uh, that uh, it's it has a lot to do with seeing earthly pleasures and elevating them into the heavenly realm. They teach that Muhammad is the last prophet. They actually do teach that Jesus is coming back to judge the world, but the way that they describe this Jesus looks exactly like the Antichrist. They teach that when Abraham came to sacrifice, he didn't sacrifice Isaac, he sacrificed Ishmael, or was going to, he was interrupted still. But again, there, there, there's, there's a lot of changes in the teachings that you'll see. A lot of their teachings actually are ancient Jewish fairy tales. We know this because the British, God bless them, had stole artifacts from all over the world and uh, brought them into their museums. And some of these ancient stolen artifacts that they have uh, or that are books that's, that are, precede the Quran, that are fair, Jewish fairy tales that write some stories that are included in the Quran, like stories of, of the Queen of Sheba uh, coming to visit Solomon and standing on this floor of glass and being amazed because she'd never seen anything like it. She didn't know. It looked like she was standing on air because it was glass. And this is actually from an ancient Jewish fairy tale. It's not scripture. 
And Muhammad, if he was illiterate, heard these stories and assumed maybe that they were scripture and included them in the Quran. Also stories about Solomon's air force. I don't know if you've heard about this, but he had a bunch of birds that would carry large rocks and drop them on people. This again was a Jewish fairy tale, not something from scripture that later was incorporated into the Quran. And something that they always emphasize, and I love witnessing to Muslims, I I truly, truly do, is God's absolute oneness, okay? Much like a Jewish person will. Because it's over and over and over in the Quran, these people who say that God is three, they're blasphemers, okay? They're specifically referring to followers of Yeshua. That's specifically who they're talking against. And they'll say it over and over and over in the Quran and talk about how that's one of the largest, it's one of the biggest sins that you can have is saying that God is three, okay? So what they did do, and we'll see this, is they put their own writings over authority over any previous writing. And we'll see how they did that here, looking in verses in the Quran. Is this the first time the Quran's been written read in this, uh, this facility? Oh, s- sorry. <laughs> Lord, forgive us. O oh, you who have believed, obey Allah and obey the messenger and those in authority among you. And if you disagree over anything, refer it to Allah and the messenger. If you should believe in Allah in the last day, that is the best way and the best result. Again, you have to believe his messenger first and foremost. And we'll look at this in the Surah chapter in Surah 4. It says that they said and boast, We killed Christ Jesus, speaking of us, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. But they killed him not, nor crucified him. But so it was made to appear to them. And those who differ therein are full of doubts, with no certain knowledge, but only conjecture to follow. For, for, excuse me, for of a surety, they killed him not. Nay, Allah raised him up unto himself, and Allah is exalted in power and wise. They'll go back to previous scripture and they'll say that didn't happen. But because secondary revelation takes precedence over any previous scripture, it doesn't even matter. Okay? So this is how you can see cult developing. This is how you can see these misteachings developing. When they're discounting previous scriptural revelation and saying that's not important. What's important is what we're teaching you. It says, Ye people of the book, why do you clothe truth with falsehoods and conceal the truth while you have knowledge? So they're saying that people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, are concealing truth are warping scripture. It says, There is among them a section who distort the book with their tongues as they read. You would think it is part of the book, but it is not part of the book. So the way that they justify their beliefs is by stating, we changed it. Disregard archaeological evidence. Okay, Disregard anything that can be proven. Disregard the history, disregard the corporate revelation, disregard all these things. Just listen to this one revelation from this one man because his secondary revelation takes precedence over anything else and it developed into cult. This is a little bit of my expertise here. Rabbinical Judaism. As it's known today, probably was formed somewhere around 200 AD. They proudly traced their origins to the Pharisees. Parashim, as they call them. But the, so they, the Pharisees believed in something called the oral tradition. We see this in Scripture. This is mentioned by Yeshua. The old tradition was understood to be when Moses came down with the Ten Commandments, he didn't just come down with the written law, even though over and over in Scripture, it's, it, it, God instructs Moses, write down all the words that I've given you, okay? Over and over, Moses, God tells Moses, write down all the words, write down all the words, write down all the words. Rabbinical Jews say, well, they didn't write down all the words. Okay. Okay. So instead, what they say is that there were also these oral traditions. For example, when there's a section of scripture that says that you are to take a pinch of this and put it on the altar, they say, how do we know what a pinch is? How do we know? How do we know exactly how much that is? Unless we have the oral tradition. Okay, so these are their arguments. Develop the rabbis into the positions that they're in. 
we'll go into that in a little bit here. They wrote the first fundamental book. There were many, but their first fundamental was called the Mishnah. The Mishnah is a series of legal writings, okay, of what, what needs to be followed. And when they meshed that together with the Gomorrah, which is a commentary on the Mishnah and the Torah, it, it creates a section that's called the Talmud. And there's two different Talmuds. There's a Babylonian and the Jerusalem Talmud. And the Talmud is a Jewish writing that is the oral tradition written down. For thousands of years, they didn't write it down, and all of a sudden they decided we better write it down. I don't know. This is interesting. In Sota, 48b, which is in the Babylonian Talmud, this is an important section of Scripture, especially when speaking, out to, or when speaking with Jewish people. We'll go into one that's much more important. But it says, For our rabbis have taught, when Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi died, the Holy Spirit departed from Israel. You'll see that number 10 there, I apologize. Actually, the, what, what that is in the Talmud is these little sections that are referring to different things throughout, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But, so, it says that the Holy Spirit departed from Israel. There is no longer a presence of the Holy Spirit in rabbinical Judaism. So if God's Spirit no longer communicates with people, the most important person within the community is the one who can interpret Scripture. And so the one who can interpret Scripture becomes the most powerful, the most important, and the one. if those are the same people who know this special oral tradition, then they can interpret what you believe or what you should understand. Again, secondary revelation taking precedence over primary revelation. This is what we see in modern rabbinical Judaism. They'll take sections like this, Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 18, that says, You shall appoint judges and officers in all your gates, which the Lord your God gives you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. And then chapter 17, verses 9 and 10, it says, And you shall come to the priest, the Levites, and to the judge, there in those days, and inquire of them, they shall pronounce upon you the sentence of judgment. You shall do according to the sentence which they pronounce upon you in that place which the Lord chooses. You shall be careful to do according to all they order you. And that's the rabbis. They put themselves into this position. This is the position that they have put themselves in. They are the judge. They're the ones who look upon all these things. And we'll see why and we'll see what they say and how this actually becomes cultic in a very fascinating section of Scripture. I maybe even read this here before. It's actually very important. I've been reaching out to a young Jewish man and uh, it turns out that uh, on, on one ear he has me telling him about Yeshua and on the other ear he has the leading anti-missionary of an organization called Jews for Judaism, and their primary function is to prevent Jewish people from becoming Christians, and once they do, then bringing them into Orthodox Judaism. And so when I gave him this section of scripture, this young Jewish man, he was fascinated, and he told me he was going to call this rabbi's radio program. I was fearful. Honestly, the guy was because I, I figured he was well learned. He would know where I was going with this. But to my pleasure, the rabbi answered this perfectly to show him exactly how rabbinical Judaism has led people astray. And we're going to cover that right here. This is Baba Mitzia, fifty nine B. These are two people arguing over the cleanliness of an oven. That's most of the Talmud, by the way, is arguments. If you ever hang out at a Jewish home, you'll understand why. <laughs> and this was the oven of Achnai. Why the oven of Achnai? It says, said, said Rabbi Judah in Samuel's name. It means that they encompassed it with arguments as a snake, and they proved it unclean. It has been taught. On that day, Rabbi Eliezer brought forth every imaginable argument, but they did not accept them. Said he to them, so now this is Rabbi Eliezer. Rabbi Eliezer has always been in charge of the cleanliness of these ovens. Rabbi Joshua, Yeshua, as we will see here, he actually is representing the majority of rabbis. And this is what Rabbi Eliezer says here. He says, if the halacha agrees with me, let this carob tree prove it. 
Thereupon the carob tree was torn a hundred cubits out of its place. Others affirm four hundreds. No proof can be brought from a carob tree, they argued. Again he said to them, if the halacha agrees with me, let the stream of water prove it, whereupon the stream of water flowed backwards. No proof can be brought from the stream of water, they rejoined. Again, he argued, if the halacha agrees with me, let the walls of the schoolhouse prove it, whereupon the walls inclined. But Rabbi Joshua rebuked them, saying, when the scholars are engaged in halachic dispute, what have ye to interfere Hence, they did not fall in honor of Rabbi Joshua, nor did they resume the upright in honor of Rabbi Eliezer. Now, just to clarify here, I don't necessarily believe that this is a true story per se, but it is fascinating as we'll see as to where it leads with what rabbinical Judaism teaches. And again, he said, if the halha agrees with me, let it be proved from heaven, whereupon a heavenly voice cried out, why do you dispute with Rabbi Eliezer, seeing that in all matters of halacha agree with him. But Rabbi Joshua arose and explained, It is not in heaven. What did he mean by this? said Rabbi Jeremiah. That the Torah had already been given at Mount Sinai. We pay no attention to heavenly voice. Because thou hast long since written in Torah at Mount Sinai after the majority one must incline. They're saying it doesn't even matter if a voice cries out from heaven. Whatever the majority of rabbis says takes precedence over any other form of revelation. This is rabbinical Judaism. Now watch this. This part here, it says after the majority one must incline is a quote uh, if you check on the Talmud itself, it will state, this is a quote from Exodus chapter 32, verse 32. Look at what it says. You shall not follow a crowd to do evil. They just take off not and evil, or to do evil, and they just say, follow the crowd. That is the quote, okay? Jewish people will often say, we as Christians are mis quoting scripture in order to justify Yeshua, okay? We as followers, that's what we're doing, right? But the truth is, look at what they're doing in their own authoritative writing right here. This is fascinating. This is a bit of information probably Daniel hasn't seen maybe. This is something that I had just recently run across regarding Rabbi Eliezer. This is also in the Talmud. It's in a section that's Avoda Zara. And it says, our rabbis taught when Rabbi Eliezer was arrested because of, of the Minuth, they brought him up to the tribune to be judged. And he was acquitted, as it says. And it says, when he came home, his disciples called on him to console him. But he would not accept, no, he would accept no consultation. Said Rabbi Akiva to him, Master, wilt thou permit me to say one thing? Uh, of what thou hast taught me, he replied, say it. Master, he said, perhaps some of the teaching of the Manim had been transmitted to thee. Who is the Manim? The followers of Yeshua. So we're saying here that maybe Rabbi Eliezer was listening to the followers of Yeshua, and that's why he was being rebellious against the majority. Possibly. Again, cult. I'm going to skip something here to try to get through. It's, it's a form of idolatry, and I'll just cover that real briefly. This is what happens, right? Idolatry basically can be understood in this way in, in a lot of cultures. And I've, I've spoke to many missionaries who have explained this to me. When a person's talking to a wooden statue, he doesn't necessarily think that that wooden statue is hearing him, okay? But what he does understand, okay, what he does understand is that that is that God is holy, too holy to, for him to hear him. So if he communicates to this thing, then this thing can communicate to God for him. It's, it's in between man and God, okay? That's also what a lot of these organizations are doing. They're putting themselves as an in-between between us and the Lord, okay? So as we continue, we need to, we're looking at what's authority. Where should we get our focus and our trust? In Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 15 through 19. I'll read that here in a second. 
it states, You shall surely set a king over you, whom the Lord your God chooses, one from among your brethren, you shall set as a king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother, but he shall not multiply horses for himself. No cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return in that way. Neither shall you multiply wives for himself lest he return, or excuse me, lest, he tur- he, uh, lest his heart turn away nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Also it shall be, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book for the one before the priests, the Levites, and it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. The king was to know scripture. He was to live by scripture. He was to live by Torah. This is what he was instructed to do. What we see happen with the kings, when they fell, they would do things in direct opposition to what his law stated. There is a clear example here that we see in the first section where David took a census. And he was no longer putting his trust in God and God's word. And it was clearly from God's word, right? To put his trust in him, to not count your horses. And that's exactly what he was doing, was counting his military, right? It's not just expanding, but putting his trust in it. And as a result of this, there was a direct condemnation. It is essential that we know scripture. It is essential that we check everything against scripture. Everything that I tell you tonight, check against scripture. Everything that Daniel tells you, check against scripture. He'll encourage you to do that. I know him. That's how you know that it's a, it's a good pastor often. So where do we get our authority? This is actually fascinating. In do, a friend of mine did his dissertation on messianic studies going through Acts. He pointed this out to me. He said, do you know what authority the people profess in giving, in giving the testimonies that they give throughout the book of Acts? And he went through and he told me the numbers, and I unfortunately don't have them with me. But he said, do you know how often it's the miracles that they use as authority that they're going to stand upon that this is truth? They don't. How often they use the resurrected Jesus, Yeshua born, born again, resurrected physically from the dead? few times, but overwhelmingly the authority that they stand on when they're, when they're preaching the gospel message, when they're explaining to people these truths is from the Hebrew scriptures. They're using scripture to emphasize truth as opposed to opposing it or trying to supersede it. In Acts chapter 3 verse 18 it says, but those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets that the Christ would suffer has, uh, he has thus fulfilled the prophets. Look at what the prophet said. Look what Isaiah says. Look at what David wrote in Psalm 22. Look at these things. Look at these pictures of the resurrected Yeshua. Look at these things. Look at what was supposed to happen. He's saying, go back to the scriptures. Yeshua himself, when he was walking with the people after he resurrected in uh, Luke 24, 44, went through all of the scriptures with them, showing them himself in the Hebrew scriptures. By the way, Yeshua's Bible didn't include the New Testament. Praise God for the New Testament, but that was not Yeshua's Bible. Acts chapter 26, verses 22 through 23. Therefore, having obtained help from God to this day, I stand witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those things which the prophets and Moses Uh, said would come, that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead, and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. This is exactly what happened. They're saying, so where's our proof? What authority are we standing on? We're going back to the scriptures, emphasizing scriptures, emphasizing their authority. Not our own, not our groups, but scripture. 
And that's what the early church did. They emphasized the, the authority of Scripture. When we're witnessing, the most powerful tool any of us can use is showing people Scripture. It's fascinating. God's Word has power. I came to faith not because somebody gave me a brilliant argument. Okay? I came to faith because I read the words of Yeshua and it changed my life. Scripture is powerful. If ever the opportunity is there, it's the most powerful form of, of evangelism. But also, it's so important that we understand Scripture. Otherwise, we can be led astray. Acts chapter 17, verses 10 through 12 says this. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as, excuse me, as well as men. So they checked the scriptures and they are considered to be more fair-minded, right? So these organizations that then disregard previous revelation, they say, we have this new revelation, and if it contradicts with previous revelation, that previous revelation is corrupted, it's wrong. Yeshua never did that, okay? The apostles never did that. They emphasized, okay? They didn't bring it down. So again, cult comes from somebody putting secondary revelation over primary, over, over, over the uh, scripture itself. But now there's something that's changed, right? And this is what, what the cults don't understand and what they don't get. And personally, I didn't get it before, and it's why I became an atheist. It's why many people walk away. Because if they do not have a relationship with the Lord, if they cannot speak to Him directly, it's easy to fall away. Okay? If you have to go through someone else, the only thing that often that, that pulls these people in is this strong sense of community. When I go into these groups, for a Muslim person to leave the Muslim faith, they leave, they leave everything. Their family, their friends, often their job. Same thing with Mormons, same thing with Jewish people. This is what happens because community becomes so strong upon them that they can't leave. Okay? It becomes ultimately incredibly compelling. But we have what compels us to believe is our relationship with the Lord. And this is why we have a direct relationship with the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 6, verses 19 through 20, it says, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In chapter 9, verses 11 through 15, throughout all these chapters, he's talking about Jesus as the high priest. It says, But Christ came as the high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. That is, not of this creation, not with blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of heifer sprinkling and unclean uh, sanctifies, for, uh, excuse me, for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse you, or excuse me, cleanse your uh, conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is a mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. We used to have priests interceding on our behalf at the temple of God offering sacrifices. Now we have a much greater priest in the presence of God perpetually offering sacrifices. Perpetually. We're, we can be forgiven. We can be reconciled to Jesus if we just accept Him as our Lord and Savior, if we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth. Okay? 
This is what we're called to do. And then we have reconciliation to the Father. There no longer needs to be that line of separation. One of the reasons a Jewish person wears a kippah is because they believe that God is too holy to look upon them. It's true apart from Yeshua. He is too holy to look upon us. One of the reasons that they write his name G-D is because it's too holy to pronounce. <clears throat> Excuse me, apart from Yeshua, this is absolutely true. His name is too holy. Our sin makes us dark. If we were to be in the presence of God in our sinful nature as, as, we, as we were before we were redeemed, His light would overtake us. We couldn't even exist in His presence. But now through the blood of Jesus being put upon us, we have our own light and can exist in His presence. We have a direct line to the Father. This is what Timothy, or Peter, Paul's talking about in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. He says, for there is no God, or excuse me, for there is one. Whoa, 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 I'm tired. No, I'm tired. Lord, forgive me. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So, again, one mediator. You don't have to go through an organization to know him. You don't have to go through a group to know him. You can know him personally. There's no special new revelation that you need to understand or know to know the Lord. You just have to accept his, sacrifice, his son's sacrificial death for us. us. Again, off. What am I? It's, it's now it's just getting sad. It's not funny anymore. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for this time, Father. I thank you for the ears here that we're hearing, Father. God, I ask that this message could be something that could bless some of these people, that it can be used so that they can minister to other people around them, Father. Father, so that we would all know, Father, what the emphasis is. The emphasis is this ministry of reconciliation, God, of reconciling people to you through Yeshua, Father, through what he did, God. God, just in imploring them, God, and begging them to accept this, Father. And Lord, we do, we pray for all these lost people, Father. We pray for these Mormons, for these Jehovah's Witnesses, for these Muslims, God, and specifically, Lord, we pray for your lost sheep, God, that they would know you, Lord. Apart from your spirit, from your power, God, we have nothing that we can do, Lord. We, just, we can profess the message, but we need you to do the work in their hearts, God. And we appeal to you for that, Father, because we are weak, Father. And we thank you that then you can be strong. Lord, we ask that you make us bold, that you help us, Father. You help us understand the importance of saving these people, Father. They're people dying in a fire, and we're firemen, and we need to bring them out, God. God, put that on the forefront of our minds, Father, just like the, the law was to be at the forefront of their minds, Father. We want that message, Father, the message also of your desire for these people to know you, as was spoke of earlier, Father, your love for the, even the lost, Father, that you love these people desperately. Let us know that, Father, so that we just desire to do your will for them. We thank you for this time, God. We praise you. We worship your holy, majestic, mighty, wonderful name. In the mighty name of Yeshua.